Okay, at the end, Sue's going to do the flu shots. I'm going to get one. How many need a flu shot today? So there's only four of us? Five? Who, who has not gotten a flu shot and isn't going to? Whoa, okay. <laughs> you listen carefully. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn it over to Helen. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, flu season and illness in general. And to start off with, I'm just going to explain to you like the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic. Um, and the reasons that we would want to learn how to take care of our sick people at home. And um, then I'll show you actually how you can set up a sick room and how you take care of folks. And then the book that you have uh, in front of you, we're going to refer to that when we come to certain parts of the season. <clears throat> so first, um, what is a pandemic? So a pandemic is an infectious disease that it um, makes a lot of people sick. It makes a lot of people very, very sick. And it's not just in our county or our, our city or our state or just one country. It usually is in multiple countries, and it spreads worldwide. And it hurts a lot of people. An epidemic is also widespread, and it could be across a town or a state, but it seems to have more, there's a little bit more control. Not quite so many people die, and we usually can find something pretty quickly, like when we had the 2009, we thought it was going to be a, a flu pandemic, uh, ended up just being an epidemic instead. Next slide, please. So, um, in your books that you have, it says there are three recorded influenza pandemics that have occurred worldwide. Well, I included, uh, made it four instead of three because they did call the 2009 uh, swine flu or the H1N1, they did call that a pandemic. And in the beginning, it started to be a pandemic. But we had a lot of pharmaceutical companies that quickly got together and started developing uh, swine flu shots, as we all lovingly knew them as, but the H1N1 virus. So they developed uh, immunizations, and then they targeted the group of people that were most at risk, which at that time was pregnant women and children. Um, the elders, some people were pretty upset because they weren't first in line, and we always put our elders first in line. But in this case, some of them had already developed immunities from when we had the 1968 and early 70s. H1N1, the outbreak that happened. So they actually were immunized back then, and then when it came back, most of the elderly weren't at risk for death as the young and the um, babies were and the pregnant women. Uh, so each caused by a different virus, each transmitted human to human, primarily through air, coughing, and sneezing, and each resulted in large numbers of deaths. And when we say large numbers of deaths, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people worldwide that died, not just, you know, maybe 20 people in your community, which if we had 20 in our community that passed on, we would definitely start to panic and think something really awful was happening, which it would be an epidemic. So an influenza, if an influenza pandemic occurred today, there would be about 30% of the U.S. population that were sick. So you can see that we would have a lot of people sick, a lot of people dying, and so prevention of this is the key. Next slide, please. Okay, three conditions necessary for an influenza virus to produce a disease or a pandemic. First, it's transmitted, the virus is transmitted from an animal or a bird to a human being. Then the human being gets sick and the virus replicates. Then if one human can pass it to another human, that becomes a pandemic. Right now the bird flu that we've been hearing about probably for the last 15 years now, it can go animal to, hu animal, to animal, animal to human, but it hasn't figured out yet how to go human to human. Once it goes human to human, then the bird flu will be a pandemic. Um, a lot of the CDC people feel that the bird flu will be our next pandemic. Um, but we're working hard on um, immunizations and prevention, so if that should happen, we're not going to be affected by it. So infection control. Infection control is the control of the bacteria or viruses that are in our environment. 
And one of the most important things we can do is wash our hands. Wash our hands, wash our hands, wash our hands. Don't touch your face, nose, mouth, or any of those things while you're doing chores. And, and I don't know about you guys, but I have noticed that myself, I'm always like, I'm touching my nose, I have my hands on my mouth, I, I'm touching my face, and we're making adjustments, and we have our hands about our face quite frequently. So those are habits we have to try to break, and make sure we wash our hands. Um, we need to wash our hands before we care for anybody that's ill, after we care for anybody that is ill. Um, when we enter or exit a, a sick room, like whether we're visiting at a hospital, or visiting at someone's home, or actually we have a sick room set up in our own home for our family. Um, and if you're sick, or if you're caring for a severely sick person, don't cook for your family. Get somebody else to cook for your family. Um, that would just be one more way to eliminate the spread of that illness. And that's another reason that the community of care is going to be so important that we're going to talk about. Next slide. Immunize. Be wise. And Sue is here today. And what Sue will do is at the end of the program, anybody that would like to get a free flu shot, um, she will be willing to do that. And I think you're going to use the back office, aren't you, Sue? Okay, right out in the hallway, and um, you'll be able to get your flu shot um, before you leave today. So preventing illness, number one is your vaccination. Number two is social distancing. And what that means is if you're sick, please stay home. Don't come to work. I know a lot of people feel like, oh, you know, I just don't want to call in sick. I'm going to be letting the team down. But if you're sick, stay home, get well, and then go back to work. Otherwise, everybody you work with becomes ill. Also, um, if, if you don't feel well, don't go shopping. Don't go to Walmart or Kmart because now you even have a larger group of folks. So social distancing is a good thing. Stay away from crowds. Eat nutritious foods. Get plenty of rest. Um, have regular exercise program. Manage your stress. And have good personal hygiene with the emphasis on hand washing, most important. Okay, supply and demand. Supply and demand, when people are sick, especially in a pandemic, there is going to be a shortage of just the simple over-the-counter medicines that we're going to need to do our sick beds at home, okay? Now, how many have ever been shopping at Black Friday? Okay, so you know how crazy people get just trying to get a TV or a Nintendo or whatever the latest gadgets are, the phones, the uh, even simple stuff like little memory cards, they all surround each other, there's fist fights, they trample, people are killed. If you go to YouTube, um, you can just see all of the horrible, horrible events that happen uh, on Black Friday. So you know what people are willing to do for stuff they don't even need. They just want these things. They don't need these things. Now imagine in your mind that you really needed that stuff. And all these other people did too because they had sick family members. Do you know what it's going to be like to go down and get a simple bottle of Tylenol? Do you know what person's going to be willing to fight for a bottle of cough medicine? Because the hospitals will be full. They're not going to be seeing you. They'll say, well, you need to go home, and then if this, this, or this happens, and you come back, because they'll be overwhelmed in a pandemic situation. So it's important that we stockpile right now and, um, whoops, can you go back? Oh, sorry. There you go. So, over here it says, this little lady saying, Is it just me, or does it seem a tad twisted, that exactly one day after being thankful for what we already have, we trample, push, and crush each other <laughs> to buy even more stuff? Keep that in mind. That's what it's going to be like when people really need stuff that that they have to have. Okay. All right, so how to care for the ill at home. In these books that I gave you, this red book here, on um, page 11 all the way to page 35, it has very specific things. So this is your guide, and this will help you decide things that you need to have in your sick room. We're going to cover a little bit of that today. But this is very detailed, and, and I would not have enough time to cover it all today. But why you need to prepare for the sick at home is because um, 
It'll be important if there's a pandemic. About 30% of the American population could become ill during a pandemic. It's essential to have a plan in place and create a community of care for you and for your family, for your neighbors. And some of the people that are going to be at high risk are going to be anybody that has a heart disease, chronic respiratory disease, including re asthma. So if they have like um, COPD or any of those lung issues, if they have HIV or any other immune disease, um, or if they're a diabetic, which a lot of Native Americans are diabetic, so we really need to be paying attention and we really need to prepare and plan for this. And then on all these other pages, it's going to have mild symptoms and what you can do for it. It's going to have moderate symptoms and what to do for it. And then severe symptoms and how to take care of those. It also let you know when you need to go to the hospital um, to help take care of your loved ones. Okay, so how to set up a sick room. If you can use any room that you want for a sick room. It can be a bedroom. It can be... Um, a small room that maybe is your craft room or whatever, you just move things around. You just need to have a bed in there for the person that's sick. You need to have a window so that it's open and ventilated. You need to have access to a bathroom that primarily the sick person will be using. Now, if you don't have a bathroom that can be exclusive for the sick person, then you have to clean the bathroom after every time the sick person goes in and uses it. And some of the simple things you can get to do that, you can get like these Clorox disinfectant wipes. Um, there's Lysol disinfectant wipes. There's Lysol cold spray. So there's all kinds of things. You'll want to have an antibacterial hand soap um, in your bathroom so you and the sick person and everybody in the house is washing your hands. And then this one is a dual action wipe. It has like scrubby on one side and then on the other it's soft. <coughs> Um, you want to have good lighting in the room because you'll want to see the color of their skin and how they're breathing. Uh, people that get real dusky in color or real pale or kind of bluish, they might be in severe respiratory trouble, so you have to get them to medical help. Um, you call the hospital, um, call the public health nurses, uh, and so on just to try to get help even if you're caring for the sick at home. Now there's a big difference that Sue and I were talking about between getting the flu and getting a common cold. So you can still use your sick room as your practice for something worse with the common cold. And the common cold usually just lasts a few days and you usually have a fever that's more of a low grade fever, you know, 99 to maybe sometimes 101. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of the same symptoms, coughing, sometimes nausea and vomiting, diarrhea and so on. So those are, that's a common cold stuff. That does not last as long. People that actually get the flu, they have described it as they feel like they got hit by a truck. They can't get out of their bed. They have very high fever sometimes. Um, some will have nausea and vomiting, some will not. Um, so you want to have access to a personal bathroom with a sink and running water for those reasons. So if you have somebody that's having diarrhea, and it's incontinent or it messes themselves, you're going to have to have a way to clean that up and contain that. So in the sick room, the basic supplies, you're going to have to have a bed. You'll want a side table, um, a small waste basket or bucket, and then just line that with a plastic liner. So when you throw waste in there, then you don't have to handle it twice. You just tie it up, and then it's ready to be thrown out. Uh, you'll want a dish pan, and you'll want that because if they do become feverish, you'll have to take a washcloth and then you'll do the cool sponging, and that's all described in your book. Um, you'll want to have a clipboard with a paper and pen, and that way you can write down when you give medications, if they have a fever, you can uh, write those temperatures down. And you can buy thermometers of various kinds. Um, there are digital thermometers, which most people really like because they don't take very long. They read it right out. You don't have to guess like you do with the old mercury uh, thermometer. Um, you'll want to have a flashlight with extra batteries, a small chair or stool for you to sit on, a clothes hamper so you can put the sick person's clothes uh, in that and again bag it up. Now when you're washing a sick person's clothes, it's perfectly fine. You can put them in with the regular laundry. It won't hurt anything as long as you use um, warm water and soap. 
use detergent and warm water, everything can be washed because it'll kill that. And then when you put it in the dryer, make sure that you have the dryer on a warm heat setting, not on a cold setting, because then that will also kill any bacteria or virus that we have in there. You want a bell or a call system, so if you have to leave the room for some reason, then these folks will be able to get your attention and come into the sick room. Or you can get into the sick room. Two-way radios, a telephone, and of course a TV, because sometimes that really helps pass time. When you're sick, sometimes you don't feel like TV, but sometimes it just helps you pass that time. These are some more supplies, and I've covered quite a few of these already. Um, the hand wipes or waterless hand sanitizers, and I gave you guys all little bottles of hand sanitizer. Those are good for just carrying in your purse and using them um, at, as often as you want um, when you go into the store or if you're at, at work or whatever. They're always good to have. Um, rubbing alcohol, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, you can do, for a person that has a higher fever, you can pour some of the alcohol on a cloth you could pat it on them and that helps evaporate the heat out of their body as well as the cool water sponge baths will. You'll want a measuring cup that's capable of holding at least eight ounces of water. If somebody's running a fever or have any kind of uh, illness that can cause dehydration, which could be like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or fever, or poor um, intake so their appetite's gone, you should try to give them at least a tablespoon of water every few minutes just to get them to sip that, especially if they're throwing up. You want to try to do that. Once they start taking those, then you can get like uh, those little shot glasses. So they're about an ounce in that shot glass. And then you can just get them to sip on that water and then give them one of those every hour so they're um, not going to get sick from dehydration. Uh, the other thing is over-the-counter medications. And I have a lot of medicines up here. And one good medicine that we did use years ago was Vicks VapoRub. And what they found with the regular Vicks VapoRub is that it's too strong for little ones. But they, so they developed a new, it's called Baby Rub. And when you smell it, it's very, very mild. Um, most pediatricians recommend if you're going to use it that you just put it on their clothing. And so it'll be the baby one. If you don't have the baby one, you can take regular Vicks Vapor Rub and you can mix it in a little bit of lotion, baby lotion, and that'll dilute it down, and then you can put touches of that on them. So that'll weaken that. Um, you'll want some disposable gloves like these. So if you have to clean up vomit or diarrhea or whatever, then you don't have that on your skin, you can use these. Or if they're really, uh, really high with fever, you'll want to use something like that. The other thing is an N95 respirator. You can buy these at the store. Um, you just put them on your face, and that helps protect you when their fever is high and they're really coughing and sneezing because most flu viruses are um, airborne. So that's how we pass them to one another is through the air. Okay. So like I said, you can get those in hardware stores or anywhere, or you can go to a pharmacy and ask them. They'll probably sell you a box of them there. Um, socks, underwear, pajamas, blankets, loose-fitting things. Um, and then you want personal care items for the sick person. So things that are just theirs that only they will use. Um, I like these little disposable cups, one-time use cups. So they drink out of them, you just roll them out. Okay, so uh, caution. Equipment that you bring into the sick room should stay there and should only be used by the caregiver and the sick person. So like all the thermometers and all the things that you bring in the room, dishes and all of that, um, only to be used by that person. Now, as far as their dishes go, you don't have to like keep those separate and wash them in a special way. The dishes can go either in the dishwasher or in hot soapy water if you're washing by hand and then you put water in the sink and you put bleach in the sink, just a few drops of bleach. Um, I think it's five drops per gallon. Is that right, Sue? Five drops per gallon on the bleach? It's not very much. No, it's not very much. And then you just put the dishes in there that disinfects them. If you have a dishwasher, you put the dishes in the dishwasher and the temperature is hot enough that it disinfects them. So we're good there. So you have to clean your equipment after each time you use it, and you have to clean it every day. So even though you cleaned it in the morning, you need to make sure you clean it um, at the end of the day so you can start fresh every day. Okay. Okay, so you want to plan to be at home for at least 
three weeks. So that means stock up some food, talk to your doctor about getting medication in advance. Like our, our insurance nowadays only lets us have like a 30 day supply of stuff at a time. But if you talk to your physician and say, well, I'd like to at least have three months in case something goes wrong, you know, I want to plan for the future, um, your doctor can help you with that by writing prescriptions so you'll get a larger quantity um, before you run out of it. Um, so planning ahead and creating a working community of care. Uh, what you need to do with this is Talk to different organizations, talk to people in your neighborhood, talk to your family members, and come up with a plan that if something happens, who will take care of who? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh. So this is called creating a community of care. And if you imagine that you're the caregiver, you're taking care of your whole family, and now you become ill. So you can't take care of them anymore. So who will take care of you and your family? Or if you have an elder that's living on their own, or maybe you have a son or daughter, and they're a single parent, they're living on their own, and both of them get sick, who will take care of them? So when you develop your community of care, you can then develop a plan when you develop a plan, then you can practice the plan. You can get together as a family, as a church, as a community, um, and then make decisions on, okay, uh, so-and-so is going to check on this group, and I'm going to check on my daughter and her family, and these people are going to check on us. 26% of Americans live alone. This is from statistics from 2006, and Sue and I talked about that today as well, and we think that number is a lot higher now of people that are living alone or just a single parent. Uh, single parents living with children under the age of 18, that number is really high now too. We have to think about the disabled people. We have to think about our elderly. A lot of them are living by themselves, and we have to decide who will help them if they become ill. We can't just leave them. We have to help them. So if you want to set up a community of care, there's six simple steps that you can do. Um, first is identify the people who will be part of your community of care. So like say all of us in this room, we're all friends and we just decide, well, okay, let's just uh, divide up and we're going to check on each other and we're going to take care of each other if we're sick and this is how we're going to do it and we're going to take our book and we're going to study the signs and symptoms and we're going to know what medicines to have in our houses and that kind of thing. We're going to share all of our contact information with each other. If it was like the people in this room, then we would share our phone numbers with each other and all of that information. And then we're going to talk about how will we supply food, water, and other um, help that might be needed. Now, we have stuff like Meals on Wheels and all of that, but should a pandemic outbreak happen, I don't know that those programs will run. Um, they may run only in a different way, where you have to come to an open air place to pick up the stuff, and maybe a family member is now going to have to pick it up and take it to the elder that's sick that maybe they won't be delivering. I don't, don't know, but we have to talk about that. And then we have to read about how to care for the ill, and that's in your book that you have. And it's really, it spells it out pretty simply of what you need to do and what those symptoms are. And then you need to read and discuss the information with your care group. So you can go online and you can research a lot of information. If you ever have any questions, you can always check with NIMKI. Um, we have a public health nurses and they're always willing to help you with any questions that you have and provide the education and information that you need. Um, also gather your supplies that you will need. So that means like going to the store and buying cough medicine, buying nasal spray, buying the Vicks, buying soup broth. You know, you may not feel like cooking because you don't feel that great yourself, so this is chicken broth. You can just pour it, warm it up, and you're good to go. Keep it in the fridge. So it's just little simple things like that that can make your life easy. And this stores without refrigeration, so like you don't even have to have much cupboard space to store a bunch of that chicken soup. Um, next one. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know. Yes? Okay, um, what would you do not being a my cashier is very sick like that and you can only pass your money back to you? I sometimes, I don't take it. You don't but take I don't your money? Yeah. 
I'm just saying, you know. I, I know that money has a lot of germs on it, and it doesn't just pass from your hands to the cashier's hands. Just well, this think one of the lady, she was very sick, and you know, she, 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 she had no pain, and she was wiping out her hands, yeah. and she hands her money to you. Ooh. And I didn't know what to do. I, I, I know you need the money back, but you know, I just, yeah. I didn't know. And then a couple of days later, where my, my, my daughter got sick. That's why you keep the hand sanitizer in your car. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's too. In no, your car, the yeah. The same that the cashier was sick. I think that's the main thing. I think you should have went to the manager and said, you know, you have a worker that's sick, and I really felt uncomfortable taking that money. I mean, you can buy stuff. I mean, you can't obviously run around with a can of lights yeah. and spray everything. But once you get out in your car, you can do like what Sue said. Also, all of the stores in the entryway, they have those hand sanitizer wipes. You can just pull them down. And so you could wipe it on that, but I see what you mean. Like you took that money and now it's on your hand and now is it going to go in your purse? So I, I don't know. I guess you could take an envelope to the store with you and just put all the money in the envelope and then mm -hmm. take it and spray it down and that way you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, yeah, we all understand that we live with a lot of germs every day, but I think what your point is, is that it was right there. I mean, it was fresh, because a lot of that stuff will die in the open air, but I mean, that one, she like wiped mm -hmm. your snotty nose and now you have it on your money. Yeah, because she was going for all the money. Yeah. yeah, so I see what your point is, and I guess, especially if you were around pandemic time or if we had an epidemic or a heavy cold season, yeah. I would... Probably take an envelope and just hold your envelope out and let them drop it in there. Put it in my bag, yeah. of my groceries. Put it in my bag, and then you could <laughs> spray it down when you got out to the car and well, use your hands. I don't know. But I would definitely, I would say well, something. I would say something to the management because I know a lot of places they penalize people that call in sick. Right. You can only call in sick like three times in a certain period of time, and if you call in more than that, you could get fired. So if somebody is really sick that season. They may be afraid to call in sick for fear they'll lose their job, and they're the only financial support of their family. So that might be, and so when you complain to a manager, that would just make the point clear that, listen, we don't want you to have sick people there, so don't fire these people because they're sick. Help them. Um, but yeah, that's a very good point. I've had that happen to me before, too, but. Yeah, I just wanted. They burn all their personal time, and then they don't have any. <laughs> Yes, well, yeah, some businesses yeah. don't give personal time, though. They just, yeah. Sick time. You get sick time and maybe two weeks of vacation in a year. We're all blessed to work for the tribe. They're very good to us here. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of people do take advantage of their sick time, um, and they're not sick and they call in, but there's a lot of places that have very strict rules that if you call in three times in a six-month period or some are even in a 12-month period that um, you get written up for the second time and then the third time you might even get suspended and it's different businesses medical facilities I know nursing homes do that they give you the point system and if you call in you get a point points for it and then you get disciplined and then discharged so I think we need to change our way of thinking. And also, like you said, the honesty of our employees. If you're sick, call in sick. If you're not sick, get your butt to work. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, this animal to humans, so is that our pets? No, it's usually a con an animal that's carrying a virus. That would be like the bird flu is carried by chickens and ducks and other fowl. And they pass it back and forth to themselves. And the humans that have contacted that um, virus, they usually are people that, um, in some countries, people have their animals like coming in and out of their house. They're not like we keep our farm animals. They might be an actual part of their life. Uh, some kids have pet chickens in some of these, so they're like actually coming into their bedrooms with them. Um, and then the other one is uh, with the ducks that have the bird flu that have come over and made uh, humans ill. It's usually like a hunter that was plucking, and when you pluck, the dander flies up, and they've inhaled that, and then they've gotten sick from it. Some is from the blood of the bird. 
Um, so there's a proper way to take care of your fowl when you um, are a hunter. So you can uh, prevent and avoid that from happening. The danger is when an animal gets a human sick with a virus. We, have, we don't have it yet, but if that virus, the H5N1 is a particular virus, which is the bird flu, if that mutates one more time, it will make it so if I had my chicken in my house and I got the bird flu from this sick chicken, then I passed it to another member of my family. If it'll pass human to human, that's when it becomes pandemic because birds are everywhere. And because birds are everywhere, all it takes is one human to come in contact. We are a very, um, human beings move a lot. We travel a lot. Uh, it's not back like back in the day where you lived is where you lived and you might go you know, a couple hours away to visit another family member. But now many of us hop on the plane and you know we fly here, we fly there, we travel in our cars. We can in a couple days, you know, we can be all the way across the United States. We can be there for a few days and come back. And so that's why the disease will spread so fast if any kind of contagious um, virus transmits from animals to humans and then human to human. So so far so good. We don't have human to human transmission yet. So if we like have inside cats, we're not gonna get sick from them. No, we're not. If no. we bring you our can chickens get, in, you can, <laughs> humans can get illnesses from animals. I think there's feline, um, like cat scratch fever or whatever. Those are true bacteria and viruses. Is that real? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, there's toxoplasmosis, which is a bacteria a that's in the um, cat litter. So like pregnant women can't touch cat litter because oh, yeah. it could get, affect their unborn child. It doesn't hurt us as adults, but fetuses it would hurt. So there's a lot of things that animals have, but we usually take good care of our animals too if there are pets in the United States. And other countries, they're at a higher risk than we are because you know, we're pretty strict here as far as getting vaccinations and all of that for animals, checking up on them, make sure they're healthy. Yeah. So no, probably not your cat or dog, but there are other animals that transmit illness. Anybody else? So with the cat, you need to empty the spots once a week? I mean, completely? Yeah, I would. I would. And you scoop it through the week to try and empty it? Yeah, only because their urine is in there and it would smell really bad if you didn't pump it once a week. But if you're if you're not pregnant, you don't have to worry about toxoplasmosis. But if you're pregnant, or if you have a little child that might be crawling around on the floor, and the cat's in and out of the litter box with the baby down there, or if the baby can get to the litter box, it could make the baby very very ill. And animals that aren't treated for parasites, if little kids eat any of that stuff, then they can get that parasite. So, if who? Oh, the kids? Yeah, like say a toddler. Toddlers get into everything, so yeah. That was kind of yucky to talk about, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, so the community of care, I hope that all of you will go home and start thinking about this. Um, I would really like to see each and every one of you have a plan for, even if it's just your immediate family, you, your husband, your children, your grandchildren, if they become ill, what will you do? And have a supply just in your medicine cabinet of the basic medications. Flu season's coming up. Cold season's coming up. Um, and just have those things on hand. And that way, if you need them, you're not getting up at midnight trying to drive to Myers and hope that, you know, they have the medicine that you want. It doesn't cost a lot of money. You can buy generic brand stuff. You don't have to pay the high dollar for the brand name stuff. Um, remember that babies under, under six months um, unless it specifically says that it's for an infant and the directions on there say that you can give it to the children, don't give it to children without advice of the pediatrician. And also I recommend that if any of you have access to um, one of the medicine men that come here uh, to the tribe, we have a couple of them that come, take some time and make an appointment just to talk to them. They have some wonderful natural things that we can do that will um, 
help us stay healthy and help us fight some of these viruses and other things just out right here in our own backyard. So it really pays to look at all of your um, access that you have, whether it be to the doctor or to the medicine man or over-the-counter stuff, and take advantage of all of that. Okay, so if there's no other questions, um, anybody that would like to... Yeah, oh, one yes. Um, do you know, is there a reason why all of a sudden you're seeing so many schools that you have meningitis? Yeah, it's just like all the other kind of illnesses that we have. <coughs> In America, we were very, very good many years ago about all the immunizations and things that we got. And we have, we've become compliant, I guess. We, we've all felt like, well, we don't need to protect ourselves, get immunizations because we're not sick. Um, so you'll see like uh, a lot of the old illnesses are rearing its ugly head. We have a lot of people that come from other countries, and in those countries, they don't immunize. So if we have a population that used to all immunize against illness, and now we have a population that has decided that um, because of media, there are the risks of getting these shots outweigh the benefits, so they don't do them. And now we have people that come. We have pertussis back. It's very... Uh, risky if you've ever seen a baby with whooping cough. It's a life-threatening situation. We had an immunization that would take care of that. No, uh, many people are not getting immunizations now. And so because of that, this person comes that has the illness, the, per the other person isn't protected. So there's a great video on immunizations that you can watch um, on YouTube, and it shows that the protection, if you're immunized, just like with the flu, I have my flu shot, so if I go to the store and somebody's coughing on me, if I get the flu at all, I'll get a very mild case of the flu. If people, like my daughter, I have to drag her to the doctor and hold her down to get a flu shot. Now, she didn't get her flu shot yet, because I haven't drug her there, but when she comes in contact with that same person, now she's more susceptible to that. So if she gets it and then she comes on contact with somebody else that didn't get the immunization, then they have it and then it passes on from there. <coughs> for meningitis, there is a vaccination and they recommend it for all university students. Um, meningitis is passed mainly if you're in closed quarters, uh, like campuses, they, are, they live in very close quarters. Um, so they recommend all of the college kids get the meningitis, but it's simply that a lot of the diseases that we thought we are done with, we don't have them anymore. Um, measles are coming back, pertussis is coming back, tuberculosis is rearing its ugly head, um, and multiple other infectious diseases are coming back. Mumps are coming back, chicken pox, everybody's getting those again. We had the chicken pox shot, everybody quit doing that, so now we're gonna get the chicken pox again. So I think it's just because we used to really immunize, and then our generation, who were the immunized people, now our kids are not immunizing their kids because they listen to the media. It's kind of like if you watch the news, you have to be careful what you believe because they don't really tell you the truth all the time. Mm -hmm. So what you read about immunizations from one person will be completely different than what you read about them from another person. Well, then people don't realize that they don't get their shot, and then they get sick. When they infect someone that has, like, you know, like a chronic illness, like asthma or diabetes, right. it's much worse for those people because right. just because somebody doesn't want to get their shot or they want to go to work sick. Or, yes. You know, yes. Like, you know, Christopher last year got, I didn't know it was a kind of flu, but it was that upper respiratory one. Oh, we that RSV. Was, we thought he was having real bad asthma problems, and I was like, man, we're doing his machine, we're doing his inhalers. Took him to the hospital, and they said, well, he's got the flu. You need to, you know, and they had to do steroids and everything again. They said, well, if you would have had him to the doctor, I said, you don't understand, I had him to the doctor three times this week. Yeah. I just had him yesterday to the doctor, you know, because yeah. they said, well, we could have gave him that flu shot. So it's like, yeah, I had him to the doctor, and they didn't realize that it was a kind of flu either. No. Well, that's the other problem, too, is uh, there are so many illnesses and, and they over-medicated with antibiotics so much that now in this generation they're saying no antibiotics. So a lot of, especially young moms, say, I'm not taking them to the doctor because they're just going to tell me 
that they're not going to do anything. They're going to take my money that I don't really have, and then they're going to tell me to go home and give them fluids and Tylenol and blah, 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 and the kid gets worse and worse and worse, and so then they're back to the doctor's office or back to the ready care or into the ER, and they're telling them the same thing. So I can understand the frustration, especially of our young parents now, because they can't afford to pay those prices, and then when they get in there and they're told yeah, nothing's no, going to be done. Um, but on the other hand, if the child has a fever that's greater than 101, they need to go to the doctor. Usually it's a virus if it's something greater than that, so it would be a good idea. And like if it's a respiratory illness, I would take my chances of the doctor telling me that I'm not going to do anything, it's viral. Um, you can always ask for testing, say, well, I want some blood work to prove that it's viral. They can look at blood work and see if it's an uh, infection that's causing the blood counts to go up, or if it's just a mm -hmm. Well, I know a doctor has to, uh, most of those doctors understand now that they can't wait to give him an antibiotic. Right. Because he's a kid, if you don't say two days, he's really going to be sick. He's going to be sick, yeah. 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 And I think a lot of us feel that same way. Um, again, you know, because they don't treat with antibiotics, because they there's a resistance that's being developed that... No antibiotics is going to work for any of us, even when we're super sick and we need it to save us, if we keep abusing the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason they're not giving them anymore, is they don't, they only want to give them when we absolutely need them. They want our body to learn to heal itself. Yes? I have gotten a flu shot every year when I worked over at the casino, and then I still wind up with a flu. And God mm -hmm. said that. that Right, you can get a different strain of flu. Each each time, there's just um, certain strands that they that they cover. And I think, hey Sue, you could probably speak on this. Is there there's three and one and four and another one? Isn't there on the flu shots this year? Yeah, well, the ones we have are trivalent. They cover three strains. Um, there's a new one that's pyrodynamic. Um, they are working on a universal flu shot, which targets a different part of the virus that doesn't change so much between strains. Um, it's not available yet for our widespread use. But they are working on it. They can't, but I've been hearing that for about five years. So um, hopefully eventually they'll have more of a universal vaccine, which it was good against you know, hundreds of strains instead of three. Even if it's another strain of flu you get, there may be some cross protection so you don't get it as bad as you normally would. You know, you may be sick but not you know, having to go to ER or anything. It just depends on what strain you get. It's a guessing game every year. And the strain, they start making it, you know, beginning of the year and they, they um, do educated guesses as to what strain <coughs> they can be widely circulating the next winter. And some years, it's really good, and other years, it's like last year, where the mask wasn't going to look good. Um, this year, the C latest news from the CDC is this, this year's um, vaccine is a pretty good match to the strains that are circulating. Of course, we're just starting the flu season, so we'll find out more. If you ever want to know more about it, if you look at the cdc.gov website, there's there's everything you ever wanted to know about flu and Ebola, and probably a lot more than you ever wanted. It's a good state to go to. They also have some good stuff at the CDC website about caring for the sick at home. They have some awesome, awesome information. And also through our public health um, health department in Mount Pleasant, at their website, they have a lot of really good information too about um, the illnesses that are going around and how to treat them and signs and symptoms and where you can go to get different services. So that's why. The flu shot is just a peek in the puzzle protecting yourself. You know, part of it's eating good, sleeping good, washing your hands. Um, um, you know, it, being hydrated. Yeah, staying hydrated, exercising, exercising, <laughs> increases your immunity. Um, and you don't want, you don't want to take your food I mean, like I said, there's millions of bacteria. Many of them Thank are very good for us. They build your immune system and they help protect mm -hmm. us. So you don't want to kill off your, the, the good bacteria and viruses that live inside us. They help.
are lucky that you have NIMT because they're all top of the line over there. They're really up on their medicine, so we're lucky. Yeah. So when I get the flu shot, and like everybody I says, oh, you're, you know, I got the flu shot, now I got the flu. Mm -hmm. So when I get my flu shot today, in just about a minute here, what can I go home and take that will be preventative? Because, you know, in my mind, and I'm not talking about me, I'm just using you as an example. I'm getting the flu shot, I'm getting sick. There's nothing live in this flu shot that can make you sick. It can't, it tricks your body, it's tricking your body into thinking you're getting the flu. So you can get kind of tired and for a few days. Now, I just got my Tuesday and I haven't, I couldn't tell, I didn't feel it, I haven't gotten ache or anything. Some years I do. There's, you gotta remember, averages are this time of year, with fall coming and school back in, a certain percentage of our population is going to get sick. Right. You know, you get one out of 20 in a week. So your odds, if I give 20 people a shot, one or two of them are going to get sick because they were already going to get sick. Yeah. That's the problem. This time right. of year, everybody's getting sick. And so they, they get a flu shot and they get sick. So they think the flu shot did it. Well, they probably would have gotten sick anyway. Don't, doesn't the flu shot take a couple weeks before it really yes. kicks into your immunity, too? Yes. So you're really not protected right. for a couple weeks. So. Right. So, yes, you could actually get exposed sooner than that and that and still get it, depending on how far up in you are. Um, if you're exposed after a week, you may get it and not in the bank. Right. So, and, like, and again, like I said, it only covers three strains. If you're exposed to another strain, you still may get sick. Right. Too, an airborne illness is also passed through contact. So like if I'm sick and I am a mouth cover <coughs> and then I come in and I see you and I go, oh, hi, how are you? We shake hands. I touch something you're touching, then you touch it, and then you get it. All it has to do is get into a mucous membrane. It's transported through the air, and in the winter time, it's easier because they're, um, they're lighter because the air is heavier, so they'll float up, and that's why you get sick faster. I touch my face all day long. I never do too. really thought about it. I'm trying to break my hand. You know, I mean, I'm talking on the phone or whatever, and I'm, you know, uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> uh huh. Me too. I don't know. And makeup, did you know makeup can grow hair? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what they say to change your makeup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. um, you know, you're touching that with your fingers and then rub on your eyes and whatever was on your fingers and in your makeup. And well, it's just like if you don't change your eyeliner or whatever, if you get like uh, conjunctivitis or pink yeah. eye, or because I know Rick barely ever changes his eyeliner. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the problem is. Well, the same thing. <laughs> Sorry, Sharon. Every three. I don't know. I don't use makeup. You're supposed to throw it out every three, especially like the stuff like mascara and stuff like that. The dry stuff, you don't have to worry so much if it's wet, then it's got a medium growing. See, I only change mine out if I get sick. Yeah. And then, it's kind of like I'm usually not wearing it when I'm sick. You might buy a brand new toothbrush, but you use it when you're sick, you should throw it away and yep. get a new yeah. toothbrush. Right. Yeah. Stick it in there, that's a good idea. Well, thank you, everybody. If you're getting a flu shot, hook up with Sue. Anybody that gets